Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Naomi Hausman, and I serve as the Director of Institutional Advancement at Gratz College. Thanks to all of you for being here with us for the Schusterman Distinguished Scholar Lecture featuring Dr. Laura Arnold Liebman, Professor of English and Humanities at Reed College. This lecture series is the realization of the vision of Murray H. Schusterman of blessed memory, a community leader who served for many years on the Gratz College Board of Governors. With the generous endowment he established, uh, Gratz brings outstanding scholarly lectures to the community each year. I would like to take a moment to thank his son, Robert Schusterman and Bob's daughter, Melissa Schusterman, uh, who serves on the Gratz College Board of Governors. I welcome you both tonight and thank you and the entire Schusterman family for your ongoing support and leadership. So before we get started, a few important notes about tonight's program. Our Chancellor and Professor of History, Dr. Paul Finkelman, will be moderating the Q&A with Dr. Liebman later in the program. So at any point during her talk or during the Q&A, feel free to post your questions for her in the Q&A on your Zoom toolbar. Just know that only the moderators and presenters will see what you enter in the Q&A. Also, the program is being recorded. So following the program in a few days, we will email that link to you and also post it on the Gratz YouTube channel, where you will also find a wonderful library of our past lectures and programs. So now, please join me in welcoming Gratz College President, Dr. Zev Elif, who will be introducing tonight's lecturer. Welcome, Dr. Elif. Thank you so much, Naomi. Now, the, uh... The Schusterman Distinguished Scholar Lecture Series has a really wonderful reputation of introducing to Gratz remarkable, outstanding thinkers, writers, scholars. Uh, and usually we deliver the fall, uh, I think we underperformed. But what uh, Bob and Melissa have come to expect of uh, Gratz College representing their family, we take it uh, as no small thing. Uh, when our group met uh, to discuss who might be uh, an appropriate person to carry on that mantle, that baton, uh, it was really clear. It was really clear to me, at least. Uh, we don't have a rubric for who is a distinguished scholar, but if we were in search of somebody uh, who is a master writer and a communicator of creativity, then there's no question it's my friend, uh, Professor Laura Liebman. If we were looking for somebody who was a field changer, who made other scholars of American Jewish history look at a broader sense of the Americas than Dayenu, it would have been Professor Liebman. And if we were looking for just a scholar, just a scholar, who has challenged her peers to get more out of their sources beyond just the text and think about materials and objects and what stories those might inform for students and scholars of American Jewish history, then Dayenu, it would have been sufficient to invite Professor Liebman for just any one of those three. The fact that she is all three uh, and a friend and a colleague uh, just makes uh, very crystal clear how special she is. Uh, professor Liebman is Professor of English and Humanities at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. She is the author of The Art of the Jewish Family. It's right over there. Uh, a History of Women in Early New York in Five Objects. I'm fairly certain that it is the only uh, book, and she is the only author, therefore, to win three national book awards, three different categories for the same book, if I'm incorrect. Uh, apologize to the other terrific scholar. Uh, she is also uh, the author of Messianism, Secrecy, and Mysticism, a new interpretation of early American Jewish life, something which really changed the field uh, in its own right and won a Jordan Schnitzler Book Award and a National Jewish Book Award. Uh, she collects them uh, like nobody I know. She is prolific. She is elegant. She is a scholar of the highest level. She's my dear friend, Professor Laura Liebman, who will be addressing us today on the topic of her newest book, Once We Were Slaves, A Multiracial Jewish Family in Early America. Without further ado, Laura, I'm so glad you're here to learn with our Gratz community. Thank you so, so much for that incredibly generous introduction and for inviting me tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share screen because as Professor Ellis noted, Ellis noticed, 
uh, noted, I am very interested in objects and visuals, and I'm hoping that the images will help you get a clear idea of what I want to communicate tonight. So if for some reason you're not seeing them, definitely let me know. My story tonight begins not in the Caribbean where much of my story takes place, but rather on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, right before the beginning of World War II. And it starts with a woman named Blanche Moses. Blanche was the descendant of many of the illustrious families of early Jewish communities in the United States, including not only New York, but also Philadelphia. Um, and she was the possessor of a remarkable collection of not only documents, but daguerreotypes that she had lent out to the fledgling American Jewish Historical Society. And we find her writing to one of the early rabbis of the Historical Society, asking for his help to track down what had happened to this collection of remarkable images of her ancestors. And she notes in her letter to him that she needed his help because, as she points out, I could be reached at any time, day or evening, as I do not go out, something which seemed much more amusing to me before the pandemic began, and now I just identify with Blanche um, completely. So part of the reason why her collection was so important, not only to her, but also to the historical society, is that Blanche's collection involves some of the most illustrious members of early Jewish communities, including on her father's side, a gentleman named Isaac Moses, who was at various points one of the wealthiest Jewish merchants in both New York and Philadelphia, as well as the Parnas, or president, of Congregation Sheriff Israel and Mikva Israel. On her mother's side, she also had an incredible lineage, including um, her great-grandfather, who was Gershom Mendes Satius, the most beloved Hazan of both of those early congregations. And Blanche herself was an incredible genealogist. She often would write not only to the Historical Society, but to the New York Times, correcting them on early American Jewish history. But when it came to one of the branches of her family, she drew an uncharacteristic blank. And that was about the mother of her grandmother, Sarah Brandon Moses. She knew that her great grandfather on that side was a man named Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, who was the wealthiest Jew on the island of Barbados um, and one of the great members of that congregation on the island. And she knew also that Sarah had a brother who is prominent in both the New York and Philadelphia congregations, Isaac Lopez Brandon. But she couldn't figure out for the life of her who was the sibling's mother? Who was Abraham Rodriguez Brandon married to? And we see her sort of writing little notes to herself that ended up in the archives. Was he married to this woman named Sarah Esther? And she couldn't figure it out. And she wasn't alone in having this sense of a mystery of who was these people's mother and who was the wife of Abraham Rodriguez Brandon. Even Malcolm Stern, the greatest genealogist of early American Jewish families also had the same problem. And he came up with the same name, Sarah Esther, and he hypothesized her last name was Lopez. But it would turn out that both of them were mistaken in a way because they assumed that her last name was Lopez because she was born into the Lopez family of Barbados, when instead the sibling's mother was in fact born enslaved to that particular Sephardic family. Tonight, I want to go through the remarkable journey of these pair of siblings born enslaved on the island of Barbados at the end of the 18th century and their transformation as they moved around the Atlantic world and finally ended up in New York and Philadelphia and became some of the wealthiest members of those communities. Through the course of that discussion, I'm hoping you'll take away three main things from my discussion. One of them is really just something about Sarah and Isaac's lives, because I think they're a great example of how people who weren't particularly famous during their own lifetimes can be nevertheless incredibly fascinating to us hundreds of years later. <music> 
The second item I'm hoping you'll take away from their story, however, is something about Jews and race during this precarious time at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. So Sarah and Isaac were people who were of partial African and partial Jewish descent, and they were racially ambiguous. And oftentimes stories from this particular time period about racially ambiguous people who changed their racial status are told under the guise of what's called passing. And you may have even seen the recent film adaptation of Nella Larson's novel of the same title. And passing implies that you have somebody who is born and recognized as being one race, but somehow hides that from a community as they move somewhere else and leaves their past behind and is now able to present themselves as being a different race. And I want to emphasize that that sort of hiding was something that was never possible for Sarah and her brother Isaac. And I think this really gets at the heart of the Jewishness of their story. For both Sarah and Isaac, every single place that they went around the Atlantic world, there was some member of the Barbadian Jewish community also living in exile who knew about their early history as being born enslaved and their partial African ancestry. So it was never a question that they could somehow hide their past from people when they moved someplace new. But in spite of that inability to hide their past, the racial assignment changed. And I really wanna get at what does that mean and what can that help us understand about how race functioned differently during this time period at the beginning of the 19th century as opposed to now. The third thing that I'm hoping you'll take away from tonight, besides something interesting about Sarah and Isaac and something about race, is really rethinking that category of multiracial Jewish history that many of you may have seen recent surveys of American Jewish communities that emphasize the diversity of American Jewish people. But we often talk about that history as if it's somehow very recent. And I'm hoping the story of Sarah and Isaac will help you push that history much further back in time and to think about how we should be thinking about the longer story of the diversity of American Judaism. So with those three things in mind, I want to take us to the eastern part of the Caribbean, to the island of Barbados, where their lives began. I mentioned that Sarah and Isaac had a father named Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, and that their mother was this woman named Esther, Sarah Esther Lopez, though she also went by a couple other different names, which fortunately for me, her father mentioned in his will that she went by multiple names. It's sort of like a gold mine for a historian to have that kind of confirmation. And she had this brother named Isaac Lopez Brandon. But the couple also had at least two other siblings that appear to have died when they were very young and never grew up. While their father was both a merchant and a landowner and had a number of plantations along the western side of the island, Sarah and Isaac and their mother didn't grow up on one of the island's many plantations, but rather grew up in the main port town of Bridgetown. They grew up along a street called Swan Street, or you can see underneath it, perhaps very faintly, it says, or Jew Street, because this was the street where many, many of the island's Jews lived. They lived there not only because it was very close to the Nita Israel synagogue, but also because it was an important mercantile street where many people had shops. Both the siblings owners, the Lopez family and their father were members of the Nita Israel congregation, the island's main synagogue. And at various points in his life, their father was not only a member of the synagogue board, but also the Parnas or president of that congregation. So he really is in almost all ways central to the history of Jews on the island during this time period. Unlike their father who became quite wealthy, the family that owned Sarah and Isaac were actually kind of middle-class Jews. Like many of the people who lived along Swan Street, they lived on this apartment up above a shop 
where the family sold various things. And we know that this particular family had at least two shops along Swan Street. One was a goldsmith or silversmith shop, and the other was a kind of all-purpose general store where you could buy things from fiddle strings to um, things to eat to types of cloth. In spite of the fact that the siblings of their mother grew up in this particular Sephardic household, the, when it came time to register Sarah's birth, their mother took her not to the synagogue, but to the island's main church for this particular area, which today is called St. Michael's Cathedral, but at that point was St. Michael's Church. The reason why she took her daughter there and not to the synagogue was because during this time period, it was very, very unusual for anybody to be converted to Judaism. And we know that their mother was not considered halakhically Jewish, that is Jewish according to Jewish law for this particular community. So her only choice if she wanted her children's births to be recognized was to take them to the church. But while she was there, she also had Sarah baptized. And the reason for this is a little bit complicated. The most important thing that having her child baptized did, other than obviously spiritual things, was that it allowed that her daughter someday might be able to have a legal marriage, which is something that neither Sarah's mother, nor her grandma, nor her great grandmother were ever able to accomplish during their lives. So there really is a very much a generous spirit from the sibling's mother by taking her to the church. At the same time, taking her to the church and having her baptized meant that Sarah was now beholden to how the church understood her race. And we see in the very first record of her life that she's marked down as being a person of multiracial ancestry, somebody who is of mixed race. And had she stayed on the island, she would have carried this designation of being a person of color with her for her entire life. It wouldn't have been anything that she ever could have changed according to the island's legal statutes. And so Sarah and Isaac began their life like many of the people who lived as people who were enslaved in the urban town of Bridgetown. If it and probably would have continued that way if it weren't for two very unusual things that happened during Sarah's lifetime when she was only about three years old. And those two things were first that her mother's father, a white Anglican man, passed away and left Sarah's mother and her brothers his house on an alley near Back Church Street. Now, it's really important to know this was incredibly unusual. Um, her white Anglican grandfather did not have any children by white women, any legal heirs. And so he normally in these circumstances would have followed the island tradition of leaving his estate to, the, to his siblings or to his siblings' children, to other white relations. But instead, he chose not to do that. He gave only a very small amount to his white relations and instead left most of his property to his two families by women of color. And again, this is just incredibly unusual for this time period. The location of that church, as uh, of that house, as well as um, just the very fact of possessing a house became incredibly important for the siblings' families' potential to change their status. And just dramatically, their mother and her brothers go from being people who are considered pieces of property themselves to being people who own property. But in addition, the house lo was located right next to the old churchyard where very soon after they inherited the house would be built St. Mary's Church. And this was the church where many of the wealthier free people of color attended religious services. And so the location of the house sort of sets them up to have this increase in social status. <laughs> 
It was also located, however, very near to where shortly after they got the house would be built the Methodist Church. And this is where the strategies that I used for creating this history became incredibly important. Very early on, I was really concerned that I wanted to trace not only their father's Jewish ancestry, but also their mother's ancestry as well. And this was a strategy that ended off paying off tremendously because it turns out that through their mother, the siblings were related to the most important woman in early Barbadian history. And that was a woman who, after she died, was called Sarah Ann Gill, but during her own lifetime was called Ann Jordan Gill. And she was the sibling's aunt. She was married to one of their mother's brothers. And she was important to their story, not only because she's important later, but because during her lifetime, this is a woman who used the Methodist church and religion in order to gain civil rights for both free and enslaved people of color. So she's really somebody who is tremendously important for thinking about how religion can help liberate people. And for me, this was incredibly compelling because I knew that Isaac himself during his own lifetime would also be struggling for civil rights on the island and would use many of the similar strategies only by using Judaism instead of using Methodism. So just to give you a quick overview of where I'm at in terms of the members of the family, because I know they go by quickly and they all have complicated names. Here's Sarah Brandon. Here's her brother, Isaac Lopez, Lopez Brandon. Here's their two sisters who passed away in childhood. Here's their mother, Sarah Esther Gill, and their father, Abraham Rodriguez Brandon. Again, through one of their mother's brothers, they're related to this incredibly famous heroine of Barbadian history, the first female national hero of Barbados. But I was also able to trace not only their mother's um, mother, Jemima Lopez, but also one more generation back to a woman named Deborah Lopez. And Deborah, Jemima, Sarah, all three of these brothers and all four of these children were all enslaved to that Lopez family in Bridgetown. So that was the first earth shattering thing that really changed the opportunities that were available to the family. In 1801, the grandfather dies and leaves them property. The second one, however, was something that they really owed to their own father. And that was in 1801, he took the children back to that St. Michael's church and he paid not only the Lopez's so that he, they would no longer have his children be enslaved to them, but also paid the church so that his children would forever be free. And again, I just want to call out how incredibly unusual that was for this time period. It was very unusual for people to be manumitted. And most of the people who were enslaved, not only in Bridgetown, but also on the island more generally, would have to wait to 1834 for the general emancipation in order to get their freedom. And I think it's worth noting that had that been true for Sarah and Isaac, Isaac would have been well into his 40s before he achieved his freedom as opposed to being a child. And Sarah would have already born 10 children before she came free, all of whom also would have been enslaved just like their mother was. So this early freedom in their history just radically changes not only their opportunities, but also that of the next generation as well. So again, now it's 1801, the siblings are free, but they're living like many of the people who are free, but people of color in and around Swan Street who have connections to not only the churches, but often some kin ties to the synagogue, but they're always forever at the margins of that synagogue because of this policy of refusing to convert people to Judaism on the island. And their lives might have been gone on like many of these other people of partial Jewish and partial African ancestry living in this particular port town if it weren't for the fact that in 1811, Isaac decided enough was enough. He didn't want to be on the margins of the Jewish community, but rather he had a spiritual awakening and unlike his aunt who became a Methodist, 
he wanted to be Jewish. And so Isaac decides if he can't be a Jew by converting on the island, he's going to leave the island and travel south to the nearby colony of Suriname in order to convert to Judaism. So for most of us today, Suriname probably is not the most obvious place to go to convert to Judaism. So I think it's worth pointing out like, why? Why do they go to Suriname? So you'll notice it's, it's pretty nearby, so that kind of makes sense. Um, but it's also really important that during this time period, Suriname and this little peanut shaped island off the coast of Venezuela had the two largest Jewish communities in all of the Americas. So these are communities that are not only larger, but have much better infrastructure than anything you would find in New York or Philadelphia or Charleston during this time period, let alone Barbados. So really obvious that they would want to choose one of these two communities to go to in order to convert. And of those two, Suriname had an extra appeal, and that is that it had the largest community of people of multiracial ancestry who belong to a Jewish community anywhere in the Americas. So in that sense, Suriname is a much more obvious choice than this little island of Curacao over here. So I think it's worth asking again, so why? Why was it such a diverse community? And the answer to that lies not in the main port of Parimaribo, where the siblings were to settle during their conversion experience, but rather down the river to a place called Yodin Savanna or Jews Savanna. So Yodin Savanna was the first semi-autonomous Jewish community in the Americas, and it was started during the 17th century. And it was a place where many of the Jews believed that they could become the sponsors of a new Jerusalem in the Americas. And in order to bring about that new Jerusalem, they tried to follow various laws from not only rabbinical Judaism, but also from the Bible itself. And in particular, they did things like setting up their synagogue on the highest point in the town. They also laid out the town as if it was an imitation of how the tribes were laid out around the tabernacle and the book of Shemot. And in addition, they wanted to follow the laws of keeping slaves that were found in the Torah. So as part of this, they decided that they were going to, at various points, either circumcise or convert enslaved peoples. And they tended to do so somewhat unevenly, that most, most of the people who were converted um, to Judaism, who had begun their lives enslaved, were like Sarah and Isaac, people whose father happened to be a Jewish man who didn't have any other descendants. So because of this policy and this desire to keep these laws, we find that the siblings um, are seeing a community where by the time they reach the, the colony in 1811, there are people who with African ancestors who've been part of the Halakhic Jewish community for over a hundred years. So it's a very long standing community with people who've been part of it for a long time. And by the time that they arrive, over half of the community, it's estimated, has at least one African ancestor. So by the time the siblings arrive, Yodin Savannah has fallen a little bit into disrepair. So instead of staying there, they are upriver in this main port town of Parimaribo. And Parimaribo was a tremendous bustling town during this time period for Jews and non-Jews alike. Um, much of the wealth Health of the colony was through um, the incredible crops that were grown there, such as coffee and sugar and hardwoods. And But we find that along the main riverfront, we have not only these incredible mansions owned by the wealthy Jews, but also houses that were set up to take care of the poor members of the Jewish community. So really a great diversity of people, not just racially, but economically within this community. It was also a Jew, diverse Jewish community, however, in that it's the first place where we see not only a Sephardic synagogue, but also an Ashkenazi synagogue. So that means when the siblings arrive, they have a choice of where they want to convert. 
and they choose very strategically the Portuguese or Sephardic congregation. That's a somewhat obvious choice because their father was a Portuguese Jew, so it makes sense that they'd want to convert to being Portuguese Jews. But it's also a choice that would have made a lot of sense to people during this time period. So we know that for many people during this time period, the Portuguese Sephardim are really kind of the classy Jews, the people that you aspire to be. And we see this in a number of different ways. So somebody like Mordecai Manuel Noah, who's a member of the early congregation in um, Philadelphia, as well as New York, he has three Ashkenazi uh, grandparents, but if anybody asks him uh, whether he's Sephardic or he is Ashkenazi, he always says Sephardic. He claims the one grandmother who's Sephardic. Um, similarly, even Rebecca Gratz, uh, when she passes away, if you've seen her tombstone, she has this kind of lovely Sephardic style tombstone because that was the classy thing to do, right? So people wanted to be part of that culture. So the siblings go to that particular congregation to convert. And some of you may have even seen the interior of this congregation if you've been to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. After going before the Mahmud and asking for permission for Isaac to be circumcised as well as converted, the siblings would have then left this particular structure and gone to the small building behind it um, in order to co complete their conversion in the ritual bath. And um, it's, the bath is sort of conveniently located under a trap door because this was often the room used for doing kiddushes and stuff like that. And um, you would lift up the trap door and they would have gone down these steps one at a time, not together, um, and immersed and then come back up halakhically Jewish. And at the time, this would have been filled with lovely water. It's dried out and not in operation anymore today. So I had mentioned that there was a choice of where they might want to convert and that there was this other synagogue, which obviously is a beautiful, beautiful synagogue um, where they could have gone to convert. And this was the high German or Ashkenazi congregation. And this is where I think it's useful to know that within this community, like in places like in Amsterdam or London, there was a certain amount of stigma attached to being an Ashkenazi Jew. Um, such that if a man from the Portuguese congregation married a woman from here, he would be demoted in the eyes of the Portuguese congregation and would have had a kind of second class status within the community. Um, so really trying an attempt very much in not in keeping with Jewish law of kind of keeping the community separate from one another. And in fact, they even have separate ritual baths, even though they're only a couple blocks apart. There's not really any good reason for it, except for this desire for distance. But both of these congregations also discriminated or kept at a distance another group of Jews. And those were the Jews who were not only of partial African ancestry, but who were considered to be Jews of color. And here it's really helpful to know something about how race was understood differently in Suriname than it was in Barbados. So you'll remember I had said in Barbados, if Sarah and Isaac had stayed there, they always would have been considered people of color. Not so in Suriname. In Suriname, if you had seven out of your eight great grandparents were of European, uh, European Jews or European non-Jews, you could either be a person of color or you could be considered white. So if your parents were not married, you were considered a person of color. If they were legally married, you were considered white. And if your parents married after you were born, your race would change and you would be redesignated as a person who is white. And this is partially how we know that their parents never married, although they would have had the opportunity to do so in nearby Suriname, because according to the census, Sarah and Isaac are still considered uh, people of color in early Suriname. So for people who weren't whitened, even though they had African ancestors, we see the community responding to the local racism, again, very much in contrast to Jewish law, by adapting some of the Jewish rituals, particularly regarding marriage, to account for these race issues. 
And one of the key ways they do that is through their marriage contracts. So this is an early marriage contract from 1729 of a two people who were considered Jews of color according to the laws of Suriname. And we see the community inserting into the marriage contract a phrase to indicate that they're considered not white. And they do this in a very interesting way. Rather than using a phrase like they're Kushites, like you might see in some other documents from um, Jews in the colonial period that indicates they're African peoples according to language from the Bible, what we see instead is that the community inserts that they are emancipated Jews. So this really interesting phrase that doesn't imply that they're somehow a different race, but it does indicate that they or their ancestors were once enslaved. And once that designation was put in the marriage contract, and unless they were able to um, somehow have their parents legally marry, and again, their race might change, they would have been given a second class status in the congregations, either one of the two Jewish congregations. So if you were considered an emancipated Jew or a Jew of color, you would have to sit in the bad seats in the synagogue, you would be buried in the swampy part of the synagogue, you uh, swampy part of the synagogue, the swampy part of the cemetery. Um, you couldn't be called up to the Torah for honors, and you couldn't vote in any synagogue elections in order to change that particular designation. So this really means that people in that second class status, again, completely in variance with Jewish law, have the sort of persistent um, discrimination against them, even as they're being accepted in terms of being Jewish. And I think this can help us understand why Sarah and Isaac perhaps decide not to stay in Suriname, because had they stayed there, Isaac could never have been a voting member of the congregation. And his sister, had she married, even if she had married somebody who was white and had full status, her children and her husband would be discriminated against. So really um, gives us a sense of both how people were included, but also excluded at the same time. Really helpful to know that Sarah and Isaac, if that is why they didn't stay in Suriname, were not the only people who didn't appreciate this kind of discrimination against Jews of color. In fact, during the 18th century, the people who were considered emancipated Jews developed their own brotherhood called Darhe Yesharim, the Path of the Righteous. And that was located um, on Siva Plain, very close to the other congregations. This was a place where people who were considered people of color could still learn about Judaism and practice Judaism with full honors and with full amount of respect. But towards the end of the 18th century, the community decides they don't want to just be a brotherhood, they want to officially be a Jewish synagogue. And that's when they run into horrible problems with those two European Jewish run congregations. Um, and the European congregations say, no, it's illegal to start a new synagogue. And they clamp down on Darhe Yesharim. And Darhe Yesharim, again, protests to the secular government, saying the discrimination against them is illegal according to Surinamese law, which it was. Um, but the colony sides with the European Jews. And by the time Sarah and Isaac arrive in Suriname, Darhe Yesharim has been forced to be disbanded and the Jews of color had to rejoin those two European-led Jewish communities. So that helps us understand why they didn't go to this particular congregation where they wouldn't have faced discrimination. It had already been uh, disbanded by the time they arrived. So let's get forward. So shortly after their conversion, Sarah and Isaac decide to leave that colony of Suriname. And Isaac travels back to the island of Barbados, where he joins the Mita Israel congregation, where his father was a leading member. In the book, I talk a fair amount about his activism in that community and his attempts to gain civil rights, not only for himself, but for other members of the Jewish community to allow them to be full voting members on the island, something that Jews were denied unless they wanted to convert to Christianity typically. And how it turns out very, very badly for him. 
I'm not going to talk more about that now, but if anybody has any questions about it, I'm happy to talk, talk more about it in the question and answer period. Instead, what I want to do is follow his sister, Sarah, who instead of returning to the island of Barbados, with the help of her father, goes north to the city of London. Now, like Suriname, only many, many times more so, London had a huge Jewish community, so like so much exponentially bigger than what she could have ever experienced had she remained in either Suriname or Barbados. And like those two communities, it had a Portuguese congregation here, Bevis Marx, where the Portuguese Jews congregated and held services. But when she comes to the city of London, she checks in with Bevis Marx, but then heads south to what was then a suburb, but now is part of London proper, to where there were located a couple of elite Sephardic boarding schools. So these were places where the fanciest Portuguese Jews in London, as well as people from the West Indies, would send their children in order to receive an education that would help them become leaders of the Jewish world. This was a place where she would have been rubbing shoulders with members of the Montefiore family, as well as the Barrows and other really important Sephardic families throughout the Atlantic world. And it was a place where she would have gotten a really important Jewish education and with a particular Sephardic flair. So not only would she have learned some Hebrew so that she could get along in the synagogue, but she would have learned Portuguese and Spanish so that she could understand the sermons and the prayer book. In addition, she would have learned a little bit of French because that was what fancy people did. And she would have learned how to do things like give charity as opposed to being somebody who received charity as all the wealthy people in England were expected to do during this time period. She also, however, would have learned what it was meant to be a woman who was capable of running a large family household with many servants, as opposed to being a servant herself. And in all of these ways, I think it's really important to see that her Jewish education allows for her transition into becoming one of the wealthy, important Jews of the Atlantic world, as opposed to somebody who is enslaved almost as much as that conversion did. While she's in London, she also has this beautiful, beautiful miniature portrait made. And these miniatures are very small. They're only about two and three quarters inches tall by two and a quarter inches wide. And they were incredibly expensive to make. They cost basically the same amount as doing a huge portrait in oils, but they were something that people, particularly Jews, could use in order to cement relations across different towns in the ports of the Atlantic world. So because Jews often lived in these small little communities in different ports, you could send on a miniature ahead of time to sort of cement ties of the family that you wanted to make a marriage alliance with, or just to give to somebody who was your intended as a gesture of intimacy and belonging. The miniatures also, however, played a really important role for Jews during this time period in emphasizing that Jews were part of the, the fabric of elite society in the Atlantic world, including racially part of the elite. And they're really a genre which is very much indebted to a sort of magnification of the glory of whiteness during this time period. So we can see this in particular in the way that miniatures are made they're made from these very thin sheets of ivory and this is a this is not only a miniature itself but it's a miniature maker making a little miniature so sort of very meta um and we can see he's got one of these very thin little sheets of ivory where he's applying watercolors to it and he's got the woman staged um so that she imitates these neoclassical sculptures so very much a an attempt to show not only her skin as being like marble, but her entire persona as being somehow indebted to this neoclassical tradition that people during this time period somewhat erroneously associated with sort of elite culture during this time period. <laughs> 
to make those particular miniatures, people would have taken one of these tusks from an elephant and then shaved it incredibly thin and burnished it with an iron so that you get this kind of lovely glow throwing, showing through. And we can see some of that kind of glow in the ivory that you get through this technique in the close-up of the portrait of Isaac. So we can see like all the parts where he's not actually had any paint applied, where we get that kind of whoa, lovely warm glow from the ivory. And in fact, portraits like this often had a little sheet of silver placed behind them. So you would get the light coming in and then reflecting back to get that kind of magical glowing whiteness. One of the things that was so interesting to me about Sarah's portrait was how it was using not only the ivory, but also the techniques that painters were supposed to use for creating these portraits. So ivory, although it has this magical glowing whiteness, is a little bit difficult for a painter because it's very slippery. So painters would either use this little dot technique to get the paint applied or would use what's called hatching, little lines. Um, and that hatching was typically used in backgrounds or on fabric or on hair because it gave this kind of textured feel to the person. One of the things that was so interesting to me about Sarah's portrait was thinking about how it compared to portraits on ivory of other multiracial women from the same time period, including, for example, a woman from early Suriname and a woman from early New York. And we see in both of these portraits that the portrait maker is doing exactly what they're told not to ever do, which is using that hatching technique, that little line technique on the women's faces. Um, and you can see why you wouldn't want to do that or on their shoulders, because it gives the women this weird scratchy appearance. Super important to know, this is not like how the women actually looked. This is really the bias of the portrait maker completely ignoring all the rules about how to make these portraits and instead showing the women's skin is somehow flawed and scratchy. Um, so we really see them through his lens as opposed to as they presumably wanted to be seen. Very different from Sarah's portrait where the portrait maker has done all the things he's supposed to and really allows for this sort of glowing whiteness to come through and doesn't have that scratchy appearance for Sarah's skin. Also very important that Sarah through her very dress is laying claim to this tradition, this neoclassical tradition associated with freedom and whiteness and the lack of enslavement. We see that in her dress, which may look sort of like anything from a Jane Austen novel, but is actually very specific for this time period. Um, something that was dedicated to, um, that is indebted to a tradition started by the Empress Josephine, um, the wife of Napoleon, who's very much associated with Jewish emancipation during this time period. But we also see Sarah adapting it um, in ways that are telling. First of all, it's super important that as a woman who had originally been forced to work, this is the dress that nobody in their right mind could do any 19th century labor in. It's just too white, too flimsy, would be immediately ruined. So it's a dress that very much announces her freedom from labor. But it also announces her status and how high it is. You see in Empress Josephine's portrait, as well as some portraits of Jewish women from the early United States, they're much lower cut. Sarah, however, is from the West Indies. And in the West Indies, there's laws that prevent women of partial African ancestry from fully covering themselves. So for Sarah to fully cover herself is actually to show that she's more free and has more privilege as opposed to showing more skin. So a really interesting moment of the West Indian tradition kind of impacting how she's presenting herself. So with this portrait in hand, Sarah, like many Jewish women from this time period, went in search of another portrait that would be the suitor for her. And she found one in the guise of a gentleman named Joshua Moses, who was a Jew from New York and Philadelphia, who had come to London on business. He was actually there working for Stephen Gerrard, one of the very famous early Philadelphia merchants, and he's there purchasing goods for Gerard to send back to early Philadelphia. So in meeting Joshua Moses, 
she finds somebody who in some ways has a very similar lineage to her. Joshua Moses um, is the son of Isaac Moses, who again was a really important Jewish merchant in both New York and Philadelphia. Um, so in many ways we see that it's, this is as much a marriage between Joshua and Sarah as it is between Isaac and Sarah's father, Abraham Rodriguez Brandon. We have these two great merchants marrying their children off to each other um, and expanding their, their circle of business. But um, we also see that Joshua is being given access to the kind of riches that were just not available in New York or Philadelphia at the time. Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, in wanting to secure a good marriage for his daughter and wanting to secure his line through her, gives her a tremendous dowry of 10,000 pounds. So some of you who are Jane Austen fans like me will remember Mr. Darcy is 10,000 pounds and you may have always wondered like, how much money is 10,000 pounds during this time period? Um, so it's a lot of money. 10,000 pounds in uh, for this time period in um, around 1815, 1813 is about the equivalent of 30,000, 30 million dollars of spending money in the US today. So just incredible amount of wealth. And it's something that Joshua now won't have to be Stephen Gerard's man, he could be his own man and sort of finance his own business through this marriage. In contrast, um, his mother, Raina Levy, who had had what was seen as a tremendous dowry for the colonies, only brought a thousand dollars, not even a thousand pounds, to her marriage to Isaac Moses. So we really see like it's just a kind of opportunity that is phenomenal. However, things are also different than we might expect in terms of the marriage opportunities because had Joshua decided to marry Sarah, say 15 years earlier at Bevis Marks, they probably would have been able to marry in the synagogue, not because Sarah wasn't good enough, but because Joshua wouldn't have been considered good enough because he is an Ashkenazi Jew and she's Sephardic, she's a Portuguese Jew. So really this is a moment where he is also marrying up in a lot of ways in terms of the understanding of Jewish status within the London community. Unlike in Suriname where she would have something in her ketubah that indicated that she was an emancipated Jew, in London they do not have those markers that indicate she's a convert, that she's the, but a member of the Portuguese nation. And again, she has higher status in that community than he does. Shortly after they marry, they settle very close to the congregation at Bevis Marks and they live an easy walking distance, not only of the synagogue, but the docks where, Isaac, uh, where Joshua is purchasing his cloth. Um, but with, before the year is out, Sarah is pregnant with their first child and they decide to travel back across the ocean to where their families live and settle not in Barbados, but rather in New York, where at this point, Joshua's family has decided to live. So here we see um, that where they're located on the very tip of Manhattan. This is where Joshua's parents live. This is where um, the early Sherith Israel congregation is. Here is Sarah and Joshua's house. And very shortly after they arrive, not only does Isaac come north seeking better opportunities, but also the sibling's mother comes with him. And at this point, he has had a very bad experience at the Barbadian congregation, and he's been demoted to being a second class member where he can't vote, just like as if he had been in Suriname. And he comes instead first to Philadelphia and then to New York, where through his relationship to the Moses family, he's able to become a full voting member of Congregation Sherith Israel. In addition, he not only becomes a business partner of Joshua, but also marries Joshua's sister. So this may help explain why they're living right next to each other. By becoming part of this Moses family, we see that Isaac is able to overcome some of the discrimination that's going on in early New York. Really important to recognize early New York is not some sort of racial paradise. Um, people in the congregation hold very different opinions about African Americans, some of them more welcoming, some of them less welcoming. But even those, some of those less welcoming people are on the Mahmud governance board who decide 
whether Isaac should become a member, he still is accepted into the community. So again, similar to, to London, we're seeing that that Jewish Portuguese status is trumping those other issues and they don't make any reference to his African ancestry or to his enslavement, even though um, Sarah's husband had actually gone to Talmud Torah with the grandson of their enslaver. So there's people all around them who are part of that Barbados community. Um, shortly after they moved there, their first cousin from Barbados comes up and becomes the Hazan of Mikveh Israel in Philadelphia. There's all these people who know about their early ancestry, and yet they're still completely welcomed into the community. And both um, are considered white according to the census makers, and through the help of the Moses family, they petitioned to have Isaac become a naturalized citizen of the United States, something typically denied to people considered people of color during this time period, and he is naturalized and becomes a voting member, not only of the Jewish community, but also the United States. So while they're in this community, they suffer a lot of different turmoil and uh, different problems, including a number of epidemics that are sweeping through New York and Philadelphia during this time period, something I talk more about in the book. And shortly um, after they move up there, by the time Sarah's reached 30, she passes away, but not before she's had not one, but 10 children, which I think is remarkable. So like she's less than 30, has had 10 children, um, including two sets of twins, which makes the math make a little bit more sense. Um, and of those children, nine out of the 10 will live to be adults. Um, her daughter becomes one of the leaders of the Shirith Israel's school for the poor her sons become various community leaders. A number of them are um, civil war heroes, and one of them actually is a famous surgeon in early New York and helped start the Jewish hospital. Others of her sons become the Parnas, or president of the early congregation. And we even see Lionel, one of her sons, marrying Selena Satius, the granddaughter of Gershom Mendes Satius. And it's through Lionel and Selena that most of the descendants from um, Sarah who are still alive come, oops, let me go back there for a second. So they have most of the children, including Blanche, though there's a couple of other children um, who are natural children from her other sons. One of the things that was so fascinating to me about their descendants was how they continue this tradition of being so mobile and so, um, involved in the current affairs of their age. So we find of Sarah's sons, three of them end up in China, involved in trade in China and get involved in some of the terrors of the opium wars. A number of them are involved in the Civil War and the War of 1848. Some go off to San Francisco, trying to make it wealthy in the gold rush, which doesn't work out. Um, a couple of them even go down to Nicaragua and try and throw overthrow the Nicaraguan government. Again, doesn't work out, but uh, we see them very much moving all around the globe, in part because of this mobility that their parents had before them. So there's Blanche and there's the two other children by, um, by women, um, mainly women who they meet along the Texas-Mexican border. So I wanna return in closing to that story of Blanche and how was it that Blanche had no idea of what her grandmother had gone through in order to give Blanche and her father and all of their, their relatives the kind of privileges that they were able to have in New York. And here I think it's worth thinking about how much race had changed in the United States between the time when Sarah died and when Blanche was trying to figure out her genealogy. So first of all, part of the loss of Sarah's story had to do with her early death. Blanche's father was only three years old when his mother died. But even during the time when Blanche was alive, um, her father would have known about what had happened to Isaac, who whenever he traveled back to Barbados was still considered a gentleman of color back to the US white again. <laughs> 
But by the time that Blanche is writing her story, all of that has been left out of the family history. And we find instead that there's been a shift in the way that race was understood. When Sarah and Isaac came to New York, race is defined differently in different states. Had they gone to, uh, to Louisiana, they would have had their race understood differently than in New York. And it was very much in the eyes of the census taker who had a lot of autonomy in terms of deciding people's race. However, by 1920, race had changed and been much more codified, not only in the census, but in US laws, such that for Blanche to understand her grandmother as who she knew was considered white to have begun her life enslaved would be have to rethink that her grandmother was actually, according to US laws at the time, a person of color, because by the 1920 census, there was something similar to that one drop rule that we saw going on in Barbados, where somebody was had any African ancestry, they were always a person of color for the rest of their lives. And I think that helps us understand in part why although Blanche lived very close to Harlem, where there were a number of African American synagogues, she couldn't understand how her grandmother could have begun her life enslaved to the Lopez's as opposed to part of the Lopez family through kinship. And we even see that the maps from this time period emphasize that divide. So here the map where Blanche lives is colored in red by the early map makers, um, indicating that it's a Jewish neighborhood, whereas Harlem is colored gray, indicating an African-American neighborhood, as if those two things couldn't be the same. So very much in keeping with how people were understanding Jews and race during Blanche's own lifetime. So I hope that gives you a sense of the book more generally, and now would be a great time if people have any questions for us to turn to question and answer. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I'd love to hear questions. So let me start by thanking you for this wonderful lecture and talk and all of your um, wonderful pictures and really bringing to life this family. Uh, I can tell everybody who is on this uh, call that is a really fascinating book. Um, I will warn you that that you may need to keep a, uh, uh, it's like going to the baseball game. You can't play, you know, can't know the players without a scorecard because I, I think probably one of the things that frustrated you a lot is that these families are not particularly creative about names and they name people the same name generation after generation after generation but that's true in lots of early american history so it's so it's not uh it's not uncommon so let me start with a couple of questions we have a few people who have um sent in some questions and uh we will be going to them and so the first question i what I'd like to ask you is, um, and I speak now as a fellow historian um, and someone who, like you, has been honored by the Schusterman family because I gave a Schusterman lecture before I became president of Gratz and before I came to Gratz. Uh, so again, I'm just going to quickly set aside a second to thank uh, Bob and Melissa and the Schusterman family for these lectures, for bringing you here, and for all that they do for Gratz. But as a fellow historian, we started a project. And so I, I get kind of two questions, I guess. The first one is, why did you start this project? I mean, what led you, what led you to think that this, and then that melts into the second question, what surprised you when you got into it? Because we always find surprises. Yeah, I have to say, in some sense, um, the biggest thing that sort of sucked me into the project was those ivory miniatures of the two of them that I had known that Isaac had had this experience of going to Suriname and converting and then been part of the civil rights disputes. And I did end up writing a, an article that was about the civil rights disputes. But I think the thing that really kept me going back and wanting to learn more was those miniatures, like, so the miniatures are very much this genre with these big eyes where they're intended to kind of draw us in and feel kind of intimacy with the people. And I think even 
however many years later, they do some of that work still. Like we, we want to know the people that are in the miniatures. Um, and I do think if I hadn't had the miniatures, I don't know if I would have continued to like spend so much time looking into the family and um, trying to trace down who they were. Um, but definitely early on was trying to, very obsessed with like trying to make sure because as you noted, all the names end up being the same, that um, the sister who was in the miniature was the same sister who had began her life enslaved in Barbados. And it took like about five years to prove that um, of the 10 year process of doing the book. So definitely really important. I would say one of the things that really surprised me during that process was, um, particularly since I had been working on this other book that was on Jewish women in early New York, I kind of came with this lens that the women's histories, you know, the women are more oppressed during this time period and they certainly have fewer rights, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of thought or assumed that Sarah might have a harder time becoming part of the community than Isaac would. And I actually found exactly the opposite, that Sarah has a much easier time becoming part of the New York community. And Isaac has much more struggles everywhere that he goes. And I do think that this has to do with the fact that frankly, Sarah has very few rights, right? So having her be part of the community is not really pushing against um, some of the privileges that people have. Whereas if Isaac becomes a member, he can vote both in the synagogue and potentially yeah. in any of the communities um, in either in Barbados legislature or, or in the United States. So there's a lot more at stake when men are asking for, for membership and hence the there's more pushback during this time period. So that was sort of an eye-opening moment for me of realizing, ah, men during this time period have plenty of problems too, right? So important. Are, 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 is it possible that some of her easy acceptance is due to the fact that she has a powerful husband who can be her advocate in a way that Isaac doesn't have a powerful spouse who can be his advocate? Yeah, I do think that that is important that um, definitely her husband's connections make a world of difference in terms of what's going on, that her husband can buy her her seats at the synagogue. And we find even when Isaac comes to New York, his future in-laws family are the people, Sarah's brothers-in-law and whatnot, are buying tickets for him at the synagogue. So I do think there is a way in which those kin connections that they're getting are very important um, and Isaac's wife doesn't live very long after they get married she dies in childbirth so um, she just you're right that she doesn't have the same kind of social cachet that a man does in that particular community so yeah definitely. so one of one of the people in the audience has asked since we're on the subject yeah. what happened to Isaac mm. his wife dies yeah so and did, does he have any living children that does? Yeah, so Isaac, um, he has two children, only one of whom lives to adulthood. So he has one son who survives. Um, and most of the descendants that I met early on were through that son. Um, all of them were Christian, unless they've converted since then, because right after Isaac dies, Isaac lives much longer, he lives till 1855. So right after Isaac dies, he, um, the son marries the girl next door who's Episcopalian and he converts to becoming Episcopalian. So one of those moments you're like, oof, like all that work from Isaac to become Jewish and then his son immediately um, gives up on it. But um, yeah, so many descendants through that line in particular. But Isaac himself as an adult um, goes back and forth to Barbados on on business and for a while is living back in Bridgetown and then comes back to New York before he dies. Do you think it's plausible that, that Isaac's son, in fact, is so easily becomes Episcopalian because he looked at the Jewish community and said, you folks aren't very nice. You were pretty mean to my father. Uh, hmm. You know, why, why and, and, and in other words, one of the, issues that concerns American Jews today is the fact that many Jews don't end up being Jewish or their children don't end up being Jewish 
And I'm wondering if there's a lesson here that people should think about. Uh, I, I'm, I'm reminded, for example, of uh, there was a US Senator from Maine uh, named William Cohen. Mm. And William Cohen was not Jewish. His father was Jewish. William Cohen uh, studied to get a, have a bar mitzvah. And when it came time for a bar mitzvah, his rabbi told him, well, before you can have a bar mitzvah, you have to convert because his mother wasn't Jewish. And William Cohen said, no, I'm not doing that. And so mm. this important US Senator, later Secretary of State. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering if there's a message yeah. here for Jewish communities that your book is, is telling us from hundreds of years ago. Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like one of the things we could take away from this is what it would truly mean to be inclusive at various points and the ways in which people set up barriers. And I think even Sarah's like having to learn how to speak differently and how to behave differently, like in order to become accepted is one of those signs of that as much as, it, as it's a privilege to get an education, in some sense, she's sort of being retrained how to be acceptable. In terms of Isaac's son, this was actually one of the things that the family, his descendants had thought about too, was that maybe he had been rejected by the family, but it actually turned out to be not the case that even after he converted, um, he was very much, after his mother dies, he's raised by um, the, the unmarried sisters of Joshua Moses. Um, and they adore him and they leave him all of the, they leave him way more stuff than any of their other nieces and nephews. So sort of interesting that he's like okay. so beloved by, by the Moses family um, who do have these really important ties in the community. So it's, I have a hard time believing that like he grew up not feeling really part of that community, but it's possible that he heard stories from his father of what had happened in Barbados and other places. It's hard to know. So one of our other listeners is curious about if you could talk a little bit more about why William women of color uh, showed more skin in their pictures that their their picture than 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 white women. And of course, we're also dealing in this case with women who are only partially white. But um, and and I think that's of course an important issue for Atlantic world culture and American culture certainly. Totally. So this really gets at one of the ways that throughout the colonial period and into the 19th century, clothing really is an important part of how people navigate status and, and as well as race. So there are a lot of what are called sumptuary laws, both in the early United States and the Puritan colonies, as well as in the South, um, and, and particularly in the Caribbean about who can wear what. And in some places like the Puritan colonies, those are based on class. In other places like Louisiana and the Caribbean, they're really about race. And they're about using the women's bodies in particular to mark those boundaries between race. And there is, I mean, it's a very, in many ways, a really cruel system, right? That you're forcing women to have to expose themselves in terms of not allowing them to keep parts of themselves private. So very visibly showing they don't own themselves, right? Uh, yeah. um, so very painful. Um, and I think in that sense, like Sarah being able to cover herself is saying like, I own myself, right? Like I'm not somebody else's property. So it's a very different rethink, I think of how people today sometimes will sort of take modesty laws as being like oppressive to women. And here really modesty is something that's a privilege for this time period um, and very racialized. And, and of course, for slaves, even more so. Yes, absolutely. Because there's no, a, a slave woman, woman can be stripped and beaten in public and nobody cares. Yeah. Well, at least nobody who has power cares. She cares, her family cares, her community cares, yeah. but the law doesn't care. Um, so moving from that, um, into a equally complicated question is, uh, someone has asked, how is the status of Jewish people of mixed race in the United States considered prior to emancipation? And I think you may have sort of touched around that, but, but th this might need a kind of a pithy direct answer. Yeah, and so that's where I think that really, um, 
I'm not sure if people are asking about their status within Jewish communities or their status in the United States more generally, but this is where, it, again, it's so prior to the Civil War, race is so variable by location that people are really having different experiences based on where they live, as well as um, um, in some sense, like whether, who their ancestors were. So like the experience of somebody like Sarah and Isaac, is going to be very different from somebody who has a lot more African ancestry as well. But we do know that um, people did, even in more, more open and welcoming communities, we hear stories about discrimination as well. So there's a, a story that I talk about from early Sherith Israel from the 1850s, um, where it was a congregation where there's a number of women of color who had come north from Suriname, who were members of the congregation and who had partial African ancestry. And there's a German visitor who sort of interrogates them, like, what are you doing in this congregation? Why are you here? So he's he's also a visitor, right? But he sort of takes it upon himself in order to, I'm sure he's not trying to make the wind feel unwelcome, but it's pretty clear that he he does, right? So, so you do see like people within congregations, even when people are welcome, that there's a lot of questions raised about how do they become members of the congregation? Where did they come from? Is this a function, do you think, of people's physical appearance? That is, if you look like you have African ancestry, then someone questions you. But if you look like you are a Sephardi, who simply is perhaps a somewhat darker complexion, somewhat darker hair, then you're a Sephardi. And is that a function of how much money is in your bank account? Well, I definitely think that partially it's a function of how much money and how mobile people can be. But if you look at on the ground in terms of racism in early New York, um, it's not always people who are racially ambiguous can also be discriminated against. So um, one of Sarah's sons who became an important surgeon and goes to what will be Columbia Medical School right after he graduates there's somebody else who's a student there who a rumor is started by a southern visitor that he actually is a partial African ancestry and he gets kicked out of the medical school so definitely something where um, even people who appear like they could be white just the suggestion that they have African ancestors can be used as an excuse in order to disenfranchise them or to kick them out of different. In, in a slightly different field, there is a uh, man of mixed ancestry whose father had fought for the Re American Revolution. And then he, his father emancipates his two sons, moves them to Ohio. One of them will eventually become a congressman, a man named John Mercer Langston. And at one point, John Mercer Langston goes to law school. And if you live in Northern Ohio, the closest law schools are in New York. So he goes to study law with a judge in upstate New York and the judge who has a little law school. And the judge says, look, I know you're partially black. I can tell, I don't care, but I have Southern students. So you need to tell everybody you're from France and then it'll be okay, whatever that meant. Uh, yeah. Langston decided he wasn't going to study there, but I, I think I think it, it, it is a constant issue. Um, another question is, and this you again, it's a little bit off, but it's it's so intriguing. I can't help not asking it. Uh, were any of the first Jewish in the area pirates? Oh, uh, yes. The pirate story. <laughs> People say the Jewish pirates of the Caribbean always comes out. Yeah. With the Caribbean. Yeah. So. Um, Good read as a book, I would say the so if people have read the Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, um, most of the people who are like historians who work in the field, we we tend to think of them as um, not exactly pirates, you know, like they, we tend to distinguish between people who are involved um, in smuggling activities versus pirates, and then people mm -hmm. who are working on behalf of governments doing kind of scurrilous things as opposed to pirates. So. Uh, probably not, right? <laughs> so, but but I, I do think that it's sort of interesting that Lee, 
are intrigued by those stories. Like there are plenty of Jews who are doing strange and bizarre things in the colonies, particularly um, in the early community. So I, I do think that in that sense, thinking about how important smuggling is, it's just crucial in terms of early economies. And in a number of places, Jews are definitely involved in smuggling activities. And one of the things that I think is an important point from the, the Jews of the Caribbean book is that being engaged in those kind of extracurricular activities isn't necessarily incompatible with being a, an upstanding member of a Jewish community for this time period. So we definitely have people who are engaged in smuggling for their day jobs, but are, are actually important members of Jewish communities, even if they're- And, and of course, yeah. in, in wartime, if your government gave you a letter of mark, you were no longer a pirate, but rather you were an authorized combatant, authorized to seize ships of the enemy and keep everything you find on the ship. So yeah. the, the, there, there's a fine line between piracy and patriotism throughout the Atlantic world in, in those times. Um, we are past our, our time uh, in terms of how much, how long we, we agreed to keep you on air. Uh, but, uh, but I did want to um, ask you one other question, which is, um, well, two. For, for, first question is, um, have you contacted many of the descendants of the people you've written about? And how have they related to you and what you have told them about their ancestry? Uh, are they upset by the fact that they're suddenly discovering that they're not 100% white? Do they care? Uh, does it matter? Yeah, so I think this is an interesting difference between like what was going on during Blanche's time period as opposed to today that all of the descendants that I've talked to have been super excited to hear about what was going on and just to learn more about their ancestors. Even the, one of the first, the very first one of the descendants that I found was a gentleman who wanted to meet up at the St. Nicholas Society, which is kind of one of those posh um, genealogical places of like my ancestors were important in early New York. And it was in the same building at that point as Daughters of the American Revolution. I thought, oh, this isn't going to go well, but he was so excited. And his son was involved in um, as a lawyer in civil rights oh. law. And so for him, he was like, oh my gosh, and I told him, well, Isaac is very involved in civil rights activism and he felt like here was a lineage of like going down to his son that was traced through the family. So I think in that sense, like people are very, have been very receptive to the stories of their ancestors. And I fortunately haven't come across anybody who was upset. And, and again, I've found a number of times where people had stories in their family about, oh, we assume they were kicked out. And I was like, no, there are these sweet letters back and forth between them and the other parts of the family. And so I think in that sense, it, it does help show that what you assume about the past isn't always what ends up being the case. Yeah. One more assumption about the past, which ties this together. The famous plaintiff, plaintiff in the uh, Jim Crow case of Plessy versus Ferguson, Homer Plessy. Yeah. Uh, Homer Plessy is buried in the white section of a cemetery. And in the 1920, a census, the census taker says he's white. So people go from one to another because of ambiguity. And finally, this is the question, of course, that every academic has to ask every other academic. So what are you working on now? What's yeah, next? So I'm super excited about the stuff I'm working on right now. Um, I'm working on Jews and textiles in the 19th century. So it's a book all about how people are using fabrics and things that they make out of fabrics in order to create stories about belonging. So I have a chapter that's on a wedding dress that became a Torah cover and some on quilts and some on early um, samplers and whatnot. So very cool, cool stuff. And, you know, as always, I'm like, oh, fabulous objects. So, but thank you so, so much. And to everybody for inviting me and particularly to the Schusterman family. I know some of them are here tonight for sponsoring this and allowing me to come and speak to you today. Thank you. And I'm going to invite Naomi Houseman to come back and say goodbye and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Liebman, for teaching us this evening, for engaging with us. It really has been an honor to learn with you.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Finkelman, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll be sending a link to the uh, recording of this program, uh, but in just a few minutes, I will be sending an email to everybody who registered uh, with um, uh, a brief survey. We would love to get your feedback on this program so we can continue to deliver great programs uh, moving forward. So thank you, good night, and uh, hope to see you all again soon.